since we're at the top of the hour and I just want to be really respectful of Steve's time that he's going to spend with us today before he can say he wants to be respectful of your time or my time. <laughs> I'm going to offer that to him. Um, I'm just going to get us started. So uh, my name is Kelly Thompson and I'm here with the Energy Futures Lab. Um, and I'm really excited for our chat today with Steve Saddleback on truth and reconciliation within energy development. So thank you for joining and thank you for being here. And we are recording, so um, you can have that at the end of the session today and we look forward to furthering the conversation with you. So there's all these tricky things with online and with land acknowledgement and all of these pieces. So um, today I'm joining you from just south of Edmonton, Alberta. Um, I'm typically in Calgary, Alberta, so this is this is an interesting time to be able to travel and be in a different space than I'm used to. Um, but so for opening today, I just want to acknowledge the ancestral and territorial land of the peoples of Treaty 6, um, which includes the Cree, the Dene, the Blackfoot, the Salto, the Nakota Sioux, and Métis of Alberta Nation Region 4. <laughs> and so, as I'm making this acknowledgement, um, I wanted to prompt everyone to take a moment to consider why this is important. And in preparation for this, I've been doing a lot of learning around why a land acknowledgement is important and really digging into um, how and why it should and can be important for me. And I just wanted to share a bit of what I'm learning from another fellow within the Energy Futures Lab and actually a personal friend of mine, um, Deandra Brewshead from the Ghana Nation in Southern Alberta, had offered me a reflection where the idea and purpose and the why behind a land acknowledgement is it really feels similar to the national anthem that like that I practice and that I assume many of you also on the call practice. So within that concept and that framing, we don't just read off O Canada, check the box and start a hockey game. We go through the ceremony of the music, of removal of hats, of the song, of the real feeling and power behind that to honor what's come before us. And so I offer this to you because it's really opened my understanding behind this land acknowledgement and the purpose with, it, with acknowledging really a lot of the peoples and the ways and the perspectives that the history that I've learned and have been told is the truth, they haven't been a part of that. So the land acknowledgements today, while they might feel like a bit of a seatbelt, exercise. I'm really sinking into the why this is important to acknowledge these things in a way that brings the truth of the past actually into the future that we have and what we are doing now on the land today because without that history and all of those generational footsteps that have trekked across this land and cared for it, we wouldn't have the lives that we have here today. So I just invite you to consider where you are from, where you find your home or where you connect to the land and really consider what that sort of national anthem feeling and emotion is for you in the places that you connect to. And I just wanna welcome you and, hope, and enjoy our hour together. So these sessions are part of what the Energy Futures Lab has pulled together is called um, a series of big ideas for our energy future. Uh, we're discussing ideas as a community and we are showcasing different fellows within the Energy Futures Lab. So different types of topics and initiatives that really intend to bring different perspectives and stakeholders of the energy system together in a way that is moving interconnected initiatives and ideas together to create this energy system the future requires of us. So this is our second last talk. And in two weeks, we'll be chatting with Megan Lohman, who's from Community Energy Association around e-mobility in Alberta. So I encourage you to check out that if this is interesting to you.
Okay, so we're going to do a quick tech check and I'm going to apologize for the hashtag that is misleading on the bottom already. So what I'm going to invite you to do is on either your computer browser or on a phone, just through any internet browser, if you go to slido.com, um, we have, we're going to run um, a Slido app to manage the Q&A portion of the discussion. So it allows people to submit questions and we'll have a couple polls towards the end. So if you're able to go to slido.com and the top right of the slides, the hashtag is EFL, just quite simply. So ignoring the truth and reconciliation and apologizing for, for my edit there, that's wrong. Um, so if we go into slido.com, we're gonna do a quick check. So there's a poll that should come up on your device. And our poll is, and this is really for fun. Steve has prompted this, so this is Steve's humor. So how many First Nations are there in Canada is the poll question. And I'll give you a minute to make a choice and respond. Um, and then we will take a look at where we're at. And this is mostly just to be checking, not necessarily your specific language and knowledge in this area, but how well the technology is working. So I really encourage you to take a guess. One more minute. Amazing, so about half of you have responded. And roughly 642 is the correct answer. And that's where most of us are. So Steve, I'll leave that to you to acknowledge and correct as you would like. But so this is the, this is the number based on, it's, it's a roughly based on who you talk to, based on how things are moving and how the government also is determining what is and isn't a nation. So this is to give all that flexibility for all of those different components. Thank you for participating. And as Steve is moving through his presentation, you're more than welcome to add to the Q&A that's in Slido as well. So I'm thrilled to introduce you to Steve Saddleback, for those of you who don't know him. Um, Steve is the director of the National Energy Business Center of Excellence at the Indian Resource Council of Canada. He's also a member of the Samson Cree Nation, located in Muscochise, Alberta, which is a signatory of Treaty 6. He's worked for a number of national and international finance, real estate investment, banking, economic development, fiscal relations, and was a co-owner of an oil and gas lease construction company in Northeastern BC. Steve volunteers his time on numerous boards including the Indigenous Opportunities Committee. I guess, uh, you know, a quick introduction and apologies for the, uh, for, the technical, for the technical challenge there. I'll just finish off what uh, Kelly was saying. So, you know, I've worked in for a number of different organizations. I've uh, been a co-owner of a uh, oil and gas uh, lease construction company in Northeastern Alberta. Sit on a number of boards involved in, with the um, Indigenous Opportunities Committee at the Calgary Chamber of Commerce. Uh, you know, my past has uh, brought me to a number of different areas and working with First Nation communities. I uh, currently, you know, am involved as the co-chair of the Redevelop Program at the University of Calgary, as well as um, a new committee member with the Clean Resource Energy Innovation Network and uh, and a proud uh, fellow of the Energy Futures Lab. And, you know, uh, so it's it's a great opportunity, and thank you for being here today. So if you can, I've shared my screen there, and I'll run through a short presentation here, respecting everybody's time. We're at uh, ten past the hour, and I've got about eighty-seven slides to go through. No, I'm just kidding. I've got about uh, I got nineteen short slides, and everything will just really, you know, tying the topic of discussion of the truth and reconciliation and how it fits into our energy future recognizing um, you know, some of the past and then bringing it back into the present and looking towards what we're excited about. So that's a little bit of uh, what we're gonna share with you here this morning. So thank you for being here first off. As uh, 
I, I really appreciate the opportunity and thank you to the Energy Futures Lab. Uh, thank you for the land acknowledgement, Kelly, and and uh, taking that opportunity for us to, you know, take that land land, land acknowledgement and think about where we are gathered here today. Is that uh, you know we are gathered on in communities and and on lands that um, that have been occupied by a First Nation community since time immemorial. Those lands have been uh, full of uh, prosperous uh, prosperous uh, you know communities who have been trading and and sharing amongst each other and uh, which ultimately leads us to today where we're able to share in that prosper and and uh, be with you here today. So you've heard my professional bio but here's uh, you know something you may have not heard is um, is why so why why Steve and why here and why now kind of thing is why how does uh, how do I fit into this whole reconciliation truth reconciliation and our future? For those that don't know, um, I did attend the Capella Indian Residential School, also known as the Labret Indian Residential School, which is ultimately known as White Calf Collegiate. Um, for those that are new to this history and everything, um, you know, Indian Residential Schools have a there's a there's a lot of information that's now coming out there and and being a part and present to you and that is being shared with communities, both being taught, finally taught in the school education system, as well as uh, being shared amongst the general public. You heard about the, the TRC, which is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which went out and uh, captured those stories of the attendees within, uh, you know, throughout, uh, uh, you know, th throughout their, their history and, and their involvement. So when you, when you think about it, you know, we often hear, from folks, um, yeah, I've heard about residential schools, or I've, I've talked about it, and we've, we've read something about it. But oh, it's happened a long time ago, and it's you know it's been it was something that happened you know, long ago, and it was you know generations. Uh, and I go, well, wait a minute, uh, I'm I'm not quite that old. <laughs> I always joke and I say I, I like to think of myself as young but I, I'm quickly reminded by my two young children as well as my my family members that ah, you're not such a young guy anymore. <laughs> so it's you know recognizing that and recognizing that we do have um, you know that it, it wasn't generations ago it was uh, recent it was very recent and you know some of the last uh, residential schools closed back in the, in the late 90s. So I did attend the uh, White Calf Collegiate in, in La Brett, Saskatchewan. And one of the things is truth is that, uh, you know, for all of us is that res residential schools are real and we're not often taught in Canada's education system. I remember back to going through the public education system and often uh, I was that guy who was being sent to the principal's office many times because I, I, I challenged our textbooks. I was, uh, you know, getting into, uh, I called them discussions, but there were, they, you know, some teachers would look at them and say, well, you're arguing the points that's written in the book, that's presented in front of you. And it was looking at it and going, well, wait a minute, there's a lot of information that's missing from our textbooks. And something that we as Canadians haven't had the opportunity really to, to learn about in, in the proper manner. So I'm glad that we're, we're starting to see changes there and that things are fundamentally starting to shift. And this is a, you know, a history that's being, um, being looked at and, and more openly spoken about. So let's ad address the elephant in the room. You know, when it comes to word reconciliation, it, it can convey and bring in a lot of different feelings, a lot of different, uh, uh, you know, things for, for everyone is that, uh, you know, all kinds of feelings of, well, well, you know, feelings of forgiveness, feelings of being overwhelmed, and where do I even start? You know, which other folks are going, I want to come into this topic of reconciliation, talking about where do I even start? I need to do some understanding, right? uh, you know, where to begin, uh, talking about things such as compassion and how do you do it. Uh, other folks are going. You know what? I didn't. I didn't do this. So how do, how does this involve me? Why should I be in part of this conversation? Others that are, I've heard is that uh, can't we just get over it and just move on? And then some others that are feeling you know feeling of anger and everything. And all of those are very valid, uh, very valid feelings and and you know part of the part of our conversation and part of our journey. Some of the history in that is that. Um, 
I guess starting off to the top left there is one of the things that folks should know is that there, here's a photo of the Capella Indian Residential School. This was an old photo and that that building that you see there had since had a fire and burned down and that was relocated. So when I went to the Librette uh, Whitecalf Collegiate, it looked more like the, the photo that you see in the bottom left hand side there. This is a photo of Blue Quills University in St. Paul, Alberta, and I just took that a couple of weeks back here as I did a visit up in the, uh, up into that area. So one thing I'd like to point out is coming back to the top, uh, to the top photo there is you see a bunch of teepees and everything outside of the, outside of the fences. And those teepees are there because you had families that were camping there. They weren't allowed to see their children. Their children were taken from them. They were, uh, you know, that was, uh, they, they weren't allowed to enter the school grounds and they weren't allowed to participate in there. So these families are camped out there in order to, you know, like anybody, it's, your, your kids are there. So you're going, okay, well, I'm going to be here until my children come home. So that's just the reality of it. And that's something that you have to understand that, you know, this is real and this was uh, a history in Canada that we're not, uh, you know, I don't think we should be proud of, and uh, um, but it's a history that happened. On the right hand side there, and one of the, the shirts that I have on today here is, uh, this was a picture uh, taken last year at the Orchard Day in Calgary, and it's uh, Phyllis Webstad, you know, the, the, one of the main drivers being behind Orchard Day, talking about residential schools and her experience there. So I had the opportunity to sit in and listen to her presentation last year and then very thankful for the opportunity to for, for us to kind of talk and, and meet and and share that I've got those two books at home uh, that she had written and and uh, keep those in our personal collection and share those with their with my children uh, it's uh, something that I you know I'm, I'm passionate about is sharing that education so that we, we recognize history and and do our best to not repeat um, uh, mistakes where they've made, been made So from here is, um, you know, one thing that I want to look at is residential schools or impacts are real. You know, there's a website there saying visit the following website for a list of children that have been uh, lost and kids that have never, never gotten home, not, never didn't have the chance to go home. Um, so what I want to do, oh, apologies, what I wanted to do right now is to quickly share where that page goes to. This is the National Truth, uh, Center for Truth and Recon Reconciliation's website at the University of Manitoba. Here's a picture of the memorial roster and, and uh, you know, just for, just for understanding, here are the, here's the name and this is all publicly available information for children that never made it home. So I could scroll through this from some time, and I mean, if you look to the right-hand side as I'm scrolling, I'm barely making a dent in this page. So when we hear about, uh, you know, folks who have uh, who have said, you know, that, um, for whatever reason, you know, that uh, residential schools are, you know, the good and all of this kind of stuff. <laughs> I would ask all of the family members of those children that never made it home if they feel the same way. So, you know, it's a, this is a reality and it's something that needs to be taken seriously. So, uh, back to the, no, oh, sorry, apologies. Back to the presentation here. Is that understand when we talk about the loss of lives and the loss of culture, and we, we've, uh, you know, community, First Nation communities have experienced loss on many levels, not discounting any of those or anything like that, is that we, that we must remember that one thing that brings us all together is we all share in this loss. We share the loss of doctors, lawyers, teachers, nurses, scientists, chiefs, leaders, mothers, fathers, and sisters, brothers, and the potential that could have been. So this is something that we must remember is that we, that just loss is something we all share and we'll never have the chance to know what could have been. So it's, uh, you know, it's something to definitely take a minute and think about and, and go, this is reality. It's heavy stuff. It's not easy. And you know, when I give these conversations and, <laughs> excuse me, um, <clears throat> presentations, it's something that I go, 
you know, it's not a, you know, I thank the EFL for taking this, this time out. It's something that we've got to go and relive that thing every time for every single one of these, uh, these presentations. It's going back through there. And this is real. However, together, and one thing that I'm really positive about is that we've got all of you on board uh, and here today and participating in this conversation. And I can see many of your faces out here is I'm excited because together we can ensure that this type of thing never happens again. And I'm glad that you're part of this conversation and we're, we're starting along this journey. One thing that I ask is, uh, is remembrance is that for all of us, is patience and understanding, recognizing that this is a journey and we're all on it. And I'm thankful for the Energy Futures Lab for taking action and an active role in understanding uh, the truth and reconciliation, looking at things like the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, I'm sorry for the acronyms, and then how energy affects us all and bringing this and understanding how this all plays into, it, in, into itself. So where do we start? You know, recognizing some of this heavy stuff that we just discussed about, where do we begin from here for those of us that have just started this journey? What's reading the history and understanding it not, not and, and reading it from many other different viewpoints and aspects. We're looking at the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. That's, um, you know, it's something that I, I keep on my desk as well as the articles from, from UNDRIP, from the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And understanding those articles on UNDRIP and reading them and really you know, taking a deep dive into them. You know, these aren't, aren't scary or designed to undermine projects that some have stated. You know, you read it out in the media and saying, oh, UNDRIP is gonna destroy our energy, our energy sector. UNDRIP is gonna do this, UNDRIP is gonna do that. You know, it's not, um, uh, you know, I've read those and I've, I've talked to the folks who are the, the minds behind that, the, the, the um, you know, getting those into place and uh, speaking with Grand Chief uh, Willie Lillichild from, from Muskegee's and one of the authors of the, of UNDRIP is that, no, it's, these are designed as tools and guidance for true partnerships between Indigenous communities and all, and all other communities around the, on the globe, around the globe. It's not designed to be as a, you know, here's how we completely destroy projects. Because at the end of the day, that's, we're not gonna win by, by killing our economies. We benefit when our economies grow healthier as, as we do as well. And for myself, I'm focusing on this journey in terms of areas, areas of education and economic reconciliation. So working in that energy space, as I talked about here, is that you know, I'm the director for the National Energy Business Center of Excellence at the Indian Resource Council of Canada. Some of our mandates over at IRC, for those that don't know, know is support First Nations in, in attaining greater management and control of their, their natural resources, working with the federal government um, uh, fiduciary crown trust obligations, coordinating and promotion um, and acting as a liaison, if you will, or working as an intermediary with uh, go federal government, provincial governments, as well as industry uh, to, to ensure First Nations receive uh, economic benefits from natural resource development. Uh, working in having as many First Nations work in the energy industry as possible, and then ultimately to transform Indian Oil and Gas Canada, sorry for the acronym there again, into a First Nations institution recognizing that First Nation communities have the ability, the knowledge and the know-how to be able to administer their, the developments that are happening in, in their communities. So they can be a part of that and should ultimately administer those programs. We have a national board made up of First Nations chiefs from the IRC board. And then here's a co-management board, which is made up, made up of First Nations chiefs that we've got um, uh, Chief representation from BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and then Ontario. President and CEO Stephen Buffalo from IRC. And the Assistant Deputy Minister from Indigenous Services Canada. We've got the Executive Director there from Indian Oil and Gas Canada, as well as an Indian uh, Industry Representative, sorry, for, um, from Brian Schmidt from Tamarack Valley Energy. And this is a co-management board that oversees Indian Oil and Gas Canada and advocates working with federal government um, IOGC and Indigenous communities on putting pen to paper on the laws and regulations that govern on-reserve energy development. 
some of the mandates at the business center is um, you know we do communications research economic development education engagement networking and applying networking legislation and compliance so it's working in all of those areas to hit those uh, you know to developing different reports so on and so forth I'm not going to spend too much time on my day-to-day -day role over at IRC. Um, you know, I'm happy to always take that conversation offline and everything with you. I just don't, I wanted to give you a brief overview, but not necessarily turn it into, uh, hey, this is what I do on a day-to-day. -day. Um, so some of the things that I'm excited about in the work and how it ties back into reconciliation, economic development, and getting you know, Indigenous communities involved in the energy sector. One of the programs is... Uh, that we work with and I'm, I'm excited to be a part of as well as IRC is supporting is the redevelop program through the you know this is a consortium of five different universities that uh, creating that next generation of, uh, uh, of, of engineers both indigenous and non-indigenous uh, folks working alongside each other training graduate students undergrads and summer interns to gain experience uh, create new friendships and and uh, mentor that upcoming, uh, upcoming folks and you know, upcoming gen generation to understanding what are things like, what is unconventional resource development? What kind of implications does fracking have? How do we, how do we look at alternative uses to water? Um, understanding pipeline versus rail, what are the impacts? What are the trade-offs? Are there alternatives? So doing research in those areas, creating that, uh, that, th that experience and providing internship opportunities for those students who may not necessarily have that opportunity to go to school because of you know, financial challenges or whatever have you. you know, it's, it's about ultimately taking what we know and transferring it so that we, one day when we get the opportunity, we can hand off the ball to those, uh, that next generation who are much smarter than I, and, and I'm really excited about seeing what they're going to do. You know, here's some of the things that the, the, uh, the folks will learn in there is that they receive a certificate, they receive uh, Indigenous relations training for any program. These are 32 master's PhD students from across Canada that participate in this program, and they they work with, uh, you know, they, they work in community, they learn about community, and then ultimately taking that off into their careers and hopefully creating those lifelong, um, lifelong uh, relationships for wherever their careers may lead. Really what it comes down to is, um, you know, from IRC's perspective and, our, and the work that we do, it's about having good working relationships. And here's a, just an example of some of the organizations that we work with these are no mean by no means um, you know exclusive or anything like that these are just some logos that i grabbed off for you is working with each other and looking at developing opportunities be it uh, internships be it uh, looking at you know the things such as the site rehab rehabilitation program from the province of alberta and looking at inactive wells getting those cleaned up creating new programs for those and ensuring that Indigenous communities are involved in the life cycle of that is recognizing that, you know, when we understand where we've come from to where we are today is that there's a lot of capacity, but there's also a ton of opportunity. And I'm really excited about uh, where things are going from here. So why energy? Well, for myself, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's looking at and having that balance of understanding that you know, we, we can ensure responsible resource development, that prosperous Indigenous communities and a prosperous environment can go hand in hand. We can have oil and gas and we can have alternative energies. We can look at, uh, you know, attaining our local, lower global emissions and the protection of the environment. As mentioned, I have uh, young ones, so that's one of my motivations is ensuring that we leave something for our future generations looking at long-term stable revenue streams for communities. And that's one of the things that we'd had discussions with the EFL is that we recognize the impacts of things like residential schools. We recognize what, what they've done to communities and some of the ways that we're, we can deal with the energy sector is that it can be a piece of the puzzle that ultimately comes back to making those real changes for creating career opportunities uh, you know, long-term term stable revenue streams to assist with things like the, over, the massive shortages of housing, clean drinking water and everything. 
which ultimately, while they are fiduciary responsibilities and federal co government responsibilities, and we're not going to lightly or, or let that go, is that while we sit there and we've been promised all of these, you know, we're going to end clean drinking water, and the, Lib and the Liberal government came out the other day and said, you know, we're not going to be able to do that this time. Um, let's just do it ourselves. Is that you know it's it's looking at uh, finding those solutions for it, and energy can be a piece of the puzzle to 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 solving those challenges, creating our employment opportunities, building a sustainable future for us all, and ultimately that inclusivity. Having First Nation communities be a part of uh, of the energy sector, working hand in hand, things like this um, this like we have we have program where many communities in the past have watched energy development, sitting sidelines, watching trucks go by. Now it's going, oh, wait a minute. Let's, let's partner on, on uh, you know, some of this activity that's happening in and around, uh, in, within our province and in, in, in our country, and that uh, you know, we can create those long-term career paths. And then finally, is that when it comes to ESG, is that, uh, you know, Canada, we are world leaders. And we need to recognize that. We need to understand that we've been, we, that, you know, engagement of Indigenous communities is nothing that's new. It's something that the energy sector has been at the, one of the leaders in this area. And Canada is looked at globally as one of the leaders. So we need to, we need to understand that. We need to respect that. And we need to be proud of that. And it's something that ultimately, when we see dollars and we see, you know, uh, organizations pulling out of Canada saying that we're not involved and we're not ESG leaders and and we see dollars leaving it not only hurts uh, the energy sector it hurts indigenous communities too so it's something that uh, you know we need to address and we need to be uh, bring back to the table and understand that we need to bring those dollars and that investment back to Canada we need to to, to, to look at how how can we beef that up and how can we Get back to um, you know get back to, to to our number one position where we which we I, I think we fully belong and we will we will get there. So some of the resources here is that um, you know it's it's the the website page that I showed you is where to start is um, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation as well as United Nations um, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So um, if you like, uh, I'm happy to share this presentation with whoever and um, you know, pro provide it to Kelly if, uh, if folks are looking for a copy of this online so they don't have to frantically try to draw down that long, uh, that long web page from the UN. You can also Google search it. It's, pre it's pretty straightforward. Just search for Andrew. So now as remembering reconciliation is a journey. So let's take a moment to ask ourselves, how am I involved? How are we all involved and how are we taking an action on this journey? Well, through working together and supporting each other that we can build a better future and so understanding that energy can be an impact of this and how, and how this can work to, to hit those social challenges and those economic challenges within First Nations communities, which will ultimately tie back to things like economic reconciliation and back to creating you know, a space where we're building a positive out of things, out of, out of a past that hasn't been always the best. And ultimately our children and our grandchildren deserve it. So this is for all of us. And you know, it's, I always say the work that I do is not about myself. It, it never has been and it never will be. It's about our communities, our children, and, and those that come, come, are coming after us. It's building a, a, a future for them. So here's my contact information for anybody who'd like to reach out. I'd be happy to have any kind of discussions with you. It's recognizing that we have a short time here and we're already at uh, 35 past the hour. I gave you a lot of information and tried to cut down my 87 slides into 19. <laughs> but I do want to thank you for being here today. And, uh, you know, we, we, ha we have left some time for some Q&A. And I'm, I'm more than happy to, you know, answer as many questions as we can. And that's what we're going to learn from each other is having that conversation and that dialogue. So I'm happy to have that discussion and be with you for, for today. We're respecting that you're all here on your lunch hours. So thank you. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. So thank you. Amazing. And I'm back too. <laughs> the, the joys of um, the Zoom calls, right? So thanks so much, Steve. Um, That's amazing. Always. Like your perspective just bridges so many different things. and the way that you dive into 
some of these heavier topics, but like bring it back to connecting to each people from where they're at, I think is just a tremendous gift. So I'm excited to, we have some questions. So I want to start in with those. Um, so there's a lot of thank yous and a lot of gratitude in all of these. Um, the first question I'll ask is what are some of the leading examples you've seen of community led or owned energy projects? Mm -hmm. You know, we just had a, you know, there's many, many announcements and everything that are happening across Canada. And, you know, you're seeing things like, uh, you know, the recent, recent announcement here in the province of Alberta with a Cascade Energy Project. You're looking at, uh, you know, many potential things like the Wate Power and the First Nations that are actually energizing their communities up in Ontario. To some of the examples that are happening out in BC, I see a lot of opportunity out there. There are, you know, discussions of communities open owning major projects such as pipelines, and while they, you know, they can be viewed by some as controversial, I just kind of go, you know what? It's um, let, let's basic let, let's break it down to just a project. And when we look at that from that perspective, is does it make um, is it uh, make economic sense for them? And if it makes economic sense, then you know, if they've done the due diligence, absolutely. Why wouldn't why why wouldn't they shouldn't they be owners of that and participants in there? It's about creating those long-term stable revenue streams for those communities, which ultimately will make major impacts within their communities, which will solve you know it's solving all of those problems that are those challenges that that are come from the past. So yeah, so that's why I, I guess I would I would see it's just a few examples. Yeah. Um, and so just a reminder, we're using Slido, if you can, at slido.com to enter Q&A questions, because um, then through there, you can actually upvote other questions and I'll prioritize the ones that have highest upvotes. So slido.com and the hashtag is EFL. Um, so the next highest, lots going on here. So some people say that indigenous participation in fossil fuel development is a compromise in the sense that it's not compatible with indigenous values and worldview. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? And do you see a moral imperative to participate to better address negative impacts? I, I would, you know, for for many in, in a, you know, that the can just be, I guess, as many will see it from that viewpoint. And, and can say, well, how can you be an indigenous person and be a part of the energy industry? Where I go, wait a minute, it's because I care about the environment that I'm a part of the energy industry. It's quite the opposite. It's going, we recognize that we, the world need, needs energy. At the end of the day, you know, when, we, when it's looking at that, um, you know, when that uh, 730 hits in, here in Calgary, where I'm, where I'm currently am, is that the sun goes down. Lights go on, dryers and what dishwashers and everything get started. The world needs energy, and we're at a point in time right now where, you know, a lot of those alternative energies are they're they're coming on board and they're continuing to grow. They're only going to continue to grow. However, we're all, the future for oil and gas is always going to have a future, but it's recognizing that we can have both. That these alternative energies will only make our oil and gas industry more efficient, so that we'll continue to have that balance and have that mix of uh, fossil fuel development is that you know first nation communities have been involved in using um, fossil fuels for for years or, you know some for, for time and you know i, I go back to uh, folks like uh, chief uh, jim boucher and and our, and our folks that up in northern alberta who are you know using that to, to cook news and so using petroleum products for for longer than petroleum products that we know were even used for fuels in our cars so there will always be a future for that recognizing that there, yes there are impacts but being a part of that conversation so that you can ultimately look at new technologies and ways to mitigate those impacts lowering our you know our ghgs and effects on the environment so that's why I, i'm involved in that and i go we can't have indigenous uh, community somewhere along the line there's a belief that indigenous communities you know uh, and i was having a discussion yesterday Indigenous communities, uh, you know, aren't supposed to be uh, profitable and part of the energy industry. Like for somewhere, I'm not sure where this came from, um, but it somehow goes against protection of the environment. And I go, no, 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 no. We've always been prosperous. We've been prosperous and sharing and 
trading since time immemorial before Canada was ever a country. That communities have been protecting the environment. And while we're recognizing that we, we, we do need these resources, but ultimately at the same time, while you're, while you're participating in that, is ensuring the protection of it as well. And now we're working on the closures of those wells and returning those back, land back to its natural state. So being involved in that life cycle is where uh, I see it. And, you know, uh, it's unfortunate that, you know, maybe, you know, I, I always joke and I say, I've been called everything from a sinner to a saint and I wear all labels proudly. So it's, uh, you know, recognizing those challenges and, and then understanding, you know, some of those voices that are saying, are, are making those statements, are they indigenous led? Uh, when you when you look at it and you go back to our leaders, or you know, who are, uh, I look back to our leaders, our chiefs, our council, and 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 take advice from them as well as our elders, and and take direction from them. Uh, you know, IRC, we're an association of 170 plus First Nations across Canada. So I say uh, I have 170 bosses, and while I, I I don't speak on behalf of any First Nation, I ultimately take my direction from them to go in and act and um, and make reality what they're what what they want to achieve. Thank you. Are you going to sing at the next one? That's what I heard. I that's what I <laughs> Am I going to sing? No, no, no. <laughs> no, I wouldn't want to put anybody through that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. We can call you a singer after that. <laughs> um, any thoughts or comments on the proposed A to A rail project? New announcements, um, you know, a good opportunity for us to look at, um, you know, export and transmission to, to, to getting access to coastal, you know, coastal areas. Uh, exciting on one hand, uh, and I, I, I kind of go, it's a, it's, it's a bittersweet announcement because I go, okay, yes, we can now get, you know, product to international tide waters and all of this sort of stuff. But what a missed opportunity for us as Canadians to work together to support each other and to support our industries and whatever have you. Is that uh, there's a rift in Canada and we, we can't seem to, to you know, for, for some reason we have this, you know, how, how do we support, you know, each other as Canadians? I've got, you know, family members that live in Ontario. My, I've got family members that are out in BC and everything like that. And it's trying to support our local industries to, to see, recognize whenever a dollar leaves our country and it is vested elsewhere, that's a dollar out of their mom and pop shops and our communities, which takes away from building our roads, from our schools, from our housing to all of that. So it's bringing this back and looking at it from a, you know, that macro view and ultimately back to that micro and then seeing what it happens at a community level. That means that a kid is not going to be lacing up their skates because their parents can't afford to put them in a local hockey program. That's just a reality that a fa another family is looking at, well, I don't have a job now, so I have to go and look at a food bank or something like that. And I've been there and, you know, we've had impacts like that. And, uh, you know, like I said, it's a bittersweet thing. It's, it's seeing the opportunity there and the potential for it. Uh, but us as Canadians, we need to come back to that. Is how do we support each other? How do we support each, each other in our businesses that recognizing that we are all in this together, that this nation was, uh, has always been trading each, amongst each other and we should continue to do that and build that up. Mm. Amazing. Um, okay, there's a, there's a couple that kind of float around a similar theme. So I'm gonna maybe ramble a few things off, but um, uh, so how does industry who may want to sincerely have a partnership with indigenous communities in an energy project because of the increased access to knowledge and expertise avoid perception they're just trying to buy off First Nations? So there's way like an, an, another way to sort of add to the question. So um, what are ways that energy development in communities can be a part of addressing inequalities and social changes? Um, instead of being perceived otherwise? Mm. Uh, one of the things that I would do is, and I always recommend this to, to folks and whenever we're, you know, having discussions is that get involved and get involved as early as you can. Visit a community. Uh, one of the things that I'm really proud about um, in my participation in, 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 since coming to the Energy Futures Lab is that <clears throat> we discuss a lot of projects about working with First Nations and all of that. And, you know, when we recognize that 
well, we have different experiences and different paths and all of this and different path, paths that have brought us to where we are today. We're excited about building these new projects. We're excited about building them in First Nation communities. But the question was posed was, well, how many of us have been to a First Nation community? And, you know, there was a few hands that went up in the room and went, okay, so if we're ultimately going to build a project within a community, we should start by understanding what that community is. So the invitation was put out to the EFL and it was taken up. Is that, you know, um, you know, fellow, you know, we had the EFL join us in, in visiting First Nation community communities and a number of them and going around and understanding what are the social impacts and what are the, how will this, how can this project potentially change and what are some of the realities within a community you know from labor force to, to uh, transmission to things like you know clean drinking water for the project build and you know it's understanding those and um, boots on the ground is that that's fundamentally where a conversation should start is going we have an idea we don't necessarily have uh, we're not here showing up banging on the door going can you please sign this permit because we're going to go we've got our dozers on the truck right now and we actually want to go and dig up the field this afternoon it's not there and that's definitely not the way to go about it so it's that early engagement that understanding and and then from there you know communities are are happy to be true partners in that but they want to be true partners and not just you know passive and seeing things the old way of doing things back in the day of you know, uh, run, run, run on down the road, and the only way that you're finding about about something is because you got a phone call, and your your uncle saw a, a rig cruising down the down the road, and they found out, oh well, they're going to be doing doing some drilling in your backyard. Those days are over. You know, uh, communities are much more sophisticated, or, or you know, and you know, times have changed. Is that uh, you know, we've come a long way. I think the industry has come a long way. And folks and their you know the intent has come a long way since then. So let's uh, let's continue in that direction and let's create those good foundation that good foundation for relationships to be built and projects. Amazing. Um, so I'm going to do a major apology to everybody because in the interest of time, there are a few questions that we want to pull everybody through. So I want to I want to kind of wrap the Q and A with just a really strong encouragement to continue to ask questions and to also continue to be curious and just like, like keep, keep learning and keep going and moving forward. And Steve has so generously shared his contact information. Um, but there are many people, I think, in your own circles or in circles like connected to the EFL or otherwise, we're, we're all on this journey together. And I just encourage you to keep asking those questions and find the people or the resources or the websites or the calls or the webinars to like continue that journey of learning because I think we all continue to have questions always. Um, Can I just add one yeah, thing, Kelly? Please. Yeah, is this that uh, tomorrow is on shirt day. So I, I encourage everyone to, to go out there and, and uh, before you turn a uh, toss on an orange shirt, is, if you don't, if you haven't heard about it, Google on shirt day, and then just have a look at it and understand what uh, you know what September thirtieth is about. And uh, for those that you know, really briefly, uh, September thirtieth, and the reason why we choose this time of year is that uh, it's traditionally when the children have gone missing are, are taken from their families and put into um, residential schools. So uh, there's a long history of, about it, but you know, uh, you can get some concise. Um, summaries and versions out there. So I, I encourage you to do that. Thank you. All the orange shirts. So we're going to have just like three poll questions that will come up um, on your device in Slido. Um, and all you have to do is text and type in and we'll just create some space for people to respond to the questions as they come up. So uh, Steve and I are curious <laughs> about what hopes do you have for the future of truth and reconciliation in energy in Canada? That's our first question. And again, this is slido.com and hashtag EFL. To create awareness and understanding between stakeholders, eventually leading to positive developments. 
build back better. Fundamental to growth and progress in Canada. Really want to see unity in Canada where we are all looking out for the mutual benefit of each other. A just transition and leave no one behind. More truth. Unification of a country. Time of actual working together for the good of all. Clean water for everyone, yes. Sovereignty over our energy decisions, absolutely. That reconciliation becomes a part of everyone's business and personal daily practices, I love that. Amazing. Okay, so I'm gonna flip to the next one. If you're typing, you have like two seconds here. I love this. Reconciliation is the inclusion of Indigenous peoples. My hope is to see greater ownership by ind Indigenous nations. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna move to the next one. So what fears or hesitations do you still feel towards truth and reconciliation in energy in Canada? And this was great from an anonymous perspective, from a curiosity perspective, from there's a bit of vulnerability with this question, but I think if we don't recognize those fears and hesitations in ourselves, um, then they'll start to subtly take over how we act. Walking without walking, projects become more difficult. None. I love the, the strong optimist we have on the line. The important thing is we do not stop trying and be open to learning. Engagement versus consultations. That it's tokenizing, capitalistic, and exploitive. Lack of understanding of a true partnership. Ooh, polarization, yeah. That it will lose momentum when social awareness fluctuates. That is scary. That's holding us back. People expect instant results. Expect it will take longer, take a long time to resolve problems. White people will continue to only come part way and never fully see their role in it all. There are some good resources <laughs> on addressing that. Amazing. So the final question we have for you. We can go to it. Um, so again, we're, we're curious. Um, how has today's session contributed to your truth and reconciliation journey? And maybe Steve, while that's populating, I'd be curious to put you on the spot. Um, because in our discussions leading up to the presentation today, um, you wanted to share some of the experience in your interaction with the EFL. And I'm not sure if that goes beyond the visit to the nations. Um, I'm just curious if you'd like to share any more thoughts with the group on the, embarking on their own journeys. Yeah, it was definitely, um, you know, it was, you know, taking the, the initiative from the from the lab there is that taking a path that talking and into, putting it into action is recognizing that we are having you know the, the truth and reconciliation discussions at pretty much every fellowship workshop and it's been an initiative and something that the that the lab has taken undertaken and taken it very seriously is that uh, having those those uh, that knowledge and that education opportunity amongst each other and understanding that we're all coming from different backgrounds, different places and uh, you know, regardless, uh, it, it's creating a place for conversation 
and and uh, you know that that growth is is uh, has been something that I've been excited about from the lab's perspective and the action that's being done. You know, when when I hear folks are often saying, "Oh, well, I haven't been to a First Nation community," well, because I I've never I don't know anybody there or anything like that, and and then going, "Oh, wait a minute, yeah, I'll go and visit." Why? Because I truly am interested and I truly do want to know. And, and then from there going, wow, I didn't know that today. Oh, the, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for being able to meet with, you know, uh, uh, representatives from the community in an understanding how energy impacts can fit into the piece of re reconciliation and economic reconciliation. So that's what I'm excited about, uh, amongst the mi a million other things which I could, you know, talk until for the rest of the afternoon. But we are, I, I, I think uh, uh, people are probably sitting there having finishing up their lunch, going, "This guy's been yammering on for the last hour now. Can we? Can uh, I, I got other stuff to do? <laughs> no, but but thank you. Amazing. Yeah, there's a lot of gratitude in here, Steve, for your personal story, for shattering even just some bias that maybe we didn't know we were holding or that we are. Um, I really just want to leave this up so that it can continue to run. So um, I'm going to give it half a second. And I just, I just so much want to thank everyone for their participation today, for showing up, for joining all of us. Um, in two weeks on October 13th at noon mountain, um, we're going to be chatting with Megan Lohman, who's a fellow in the Energy Futures Lab, along with Steve, um, and she's talking about e-mobility network within Alberta um, and all those types of things. So we are on all types of social channels. Um, Instagram would be kind of boring for the EFL, so we don't really include it. We'd have a hard time with that, I think. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say thank you again to all of you today and um yeah leave it to steve to to close us off thank you very much kelly um again um greatly appreciate to everybody for taking the time out today to to be a part of this journey i you know i one thing that i will state is i am no expert uh, uh, the only thing i can do is share my experience and my journey so far and this is what a, you know some of the things that I've picked up along the way, and through talking and sitting with elders and everything, and being having the opportunity to participate at the at the Energy Futures Lab. So I, uh, you know, recognizing that we have uh, you know we've talked about a lot of heavy topics today, uh, we may feel you know some weight amongst you. I just want to take you take 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 a deep breath and take a a good opportunity to just release that. It's okay to feel, you know, uh, all of these energies and emotions and everything like that. But one thing, if you're if you're feeling in a negative space, it's 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 okay to feel that way. It's not okay to stay there. So let's come back and bring it back to that positive. Let's let's look at a way for for us to to continue our journeys and continue to support each other and continue to build up our communities. And so with that, I appreciate it and thank you for for being for for being here today and allowing me to be here and sharing it with you. Hi, Ike. <laughs>